Hi, welcome back to Real Auto Reports here at Real Auto Ranch. And today we have the real video, the real review on this 2013 Range Rover Evoque. So we're gonna hop in the driver's seat and try to give you as many details as we can. Of course, we might miss some. So if you wanna know more, comment on our YouTube and we will answer you. So let's hop in the driver's seat. All right, so welcome back. Today we are in, as I mentioned, the 2013 Range Rover Evoque by Land Rover. And uh, that's an interesting thing in and of itself because Land Rover really has two brands. You have the Land Rover, which people know as the Discovery or the LR3, a bunch of those kind of vehicles. And then you have the luxury brand, really, that came out in the 70s, the Range Rover. And uh, we've seen the 4.6 HSC, we've seen the Range Rover Sport and the Range Rover, and now we have the Range Rover Evoque. And in 2013, we have done a real quick video on the Evoque, and now we're going to give you the real video, the real review. And it's kind of interesting, your first impressions and how they differ after you've lived with a vehicle for an extended period of time. We've put several hundred miles on this vehicle now, and uh, we're going to give you all the details. So let's get going. All right, so to start off, what we need to talk about is the fact that this vehicle is fairly small. It is really a CUV, but it is a pretty capable off-road vehicle, as we have seen from the Top Gear video production. We know that this vehicle can actually do some pretty impressive off-road work but it is a permanent all-wheel drive system and it does have a, a, a specific coupler that is tuned by Land Rover and really unless you're a four-wheel drive aficionado those things you know the brand names and everything aren't really going to mean a lot to you but it does have the traction system that you would be familiar with if you're familiar with other Range Rovers or you've watched our other videos on the Range Rover Sport that we've tested you will also find that this vehicle has quite a bit to offer the average consumer because it is small but it has a lot of finishing touches that are pretty nice like the metal on the dashboard the non-glare dashboard the multiple tones and of course the leather and the just fit and finish that you would expect to have from Range Rover and and Land Rover really wants to deliver that so all in all we find that the presence of this car, the way that it presents itself to people, the way that your drive-up appeal is, is very positive. It's a car that, or I should say a CUV, that is not disappointing. It's, it has all of the fit and finish of a luxury vehicle, and at a little over $50,000, it should. Now, the part that you have to take into account is that it is $50,000. So you are paying a lot of money for this luxury vehicle. That's $10,000 more than say uh, the Charger sticker price that we've done on our YouTube page, the Hemi RT. Of course that's a car, so that's not as fair a comparison. But for the size and even the capability and systems, you could look at something like a Ford Escape you're not going to have the drive-up appeal. So you'd really be looking at something more like a BMW X3 or an Audi Q5 or a BMW, or I said BMW, I meant Mercedes GLK 350, which we have also tested here at Real Auto Reports. And those vehicles are going to climb that price ladder more like this vehicle. So how does this vehicle compare? Well, I will tell you that this is a more substantial vehicle feeling. It feels, uh, it feels aggressive and off-roadish, more so than, say, the GLK. The GLK really seems like an in-town, urban vehicle. This vehicle has a much more aggressive presence and look, and it's got all of that off-road prowess that you expect from a Range Rover. Now, of course, it's not going to be as capable as the Range Rover Sport or the standard Range Rover and certainly not as capable as some of the old Defenders and vehicles that we know used to be really, really good on the off-road and still are today and are very popular in four-wheel drive clubs. That said, I think that this vehicle is a nice in-town vehicle. 
It does suffer a little bit on the uh, fuel economy, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. From a driving perspective, it has a four-cylinder, 240 horsepower turbocharged direct injected motor. And what I notice is that if you're familiar with the old VW uh, TDI, the 1.8T, uh, not TDI, but the 1.8T, which is their four-cylinder turbo they used to do in the early 2000s, late 90s, and that lag that used to go with it, this car will have a similar feel from the stop. It does not seem to have that tr twin scroll uh, Ford Escape EcoBoost kind of uh, persona. And that can be a little startling, but once you get the revs up, this vehicle is pretty quick. And we'll put up for you the zero to 60 time as I'm talking here. And it might surprise you. The car is pretty quick. It's not very fuel efficient though, but it's very capable with the multiple uh, terrain system here. With your standard Range Rover setup, you've got a, a, a grass and gravel and snow mode. You've got a mud and rut, a sand, and then you've got your normal drive mode. So one of the things I'd like to sort of you know, demonstrate for you here is that turbo lag. So we're going to come to a complete stop here. And just from a complete stop, if you nail the accelerator, there you go. There's where the turbo kicks in. So you notice that is quite a lag. Now what I've noticed though, if you get used to this car, it's kind of like the new, uh, like when we did the uh, VW testing earlier, well late last year, you can do this. You can ease into the throttle and then get onto it. And it, as the revs get up, it won't seem like you're waiting for it as long. But it's not as capable as, say, the uh, EOS that we tested late last year, where it'll actually bring the revs up for you and then grab rubber as you, uh, as you go down the road. So something that I noticed in driving this car a lot, you notice it most when you're trying to execute a quick maneuver, say trying to get across a crowded intersection, trying to turn left or merge from a light. Uh, here in D uh, Denver, we have those signal lights that uh, you drive from to get onto the freeway, so you have to stop, it goes green, and you accelerate onto the freeway. That lag kinda is a little noticeable because, <laughs> because you're trying to get out next to the car next to you in the other lane. So, a couple things there. When it comes to the driving experience, the steering, I, f I really like in this vehicle. It's exact, it's got a good weight to it, and you don't feel like you're wandering all over the road. It has a real good road holding presence, and the suspension is a good combination of stiff and comfortable. It soaks up the bumps well, but it is on the more firm side of the suspension uh, structure, you know, if you will. It, it really does not uh, bounce and sway, which is a good thing in an off-road capable vehicle. Yet, it will grab traction when you're off-road, so it has enough approach and departure angle that you can do what you want to do when you go out of town. And one of the things that I noticed is that the back seat, when you lay it down, because you really have to to use a lot of the room. We went to Costco with this vehicle with three people and we couldn't get all of our purchases in the car without people holding stuff. And that's the first time I've actually had that happen with one of these smaller CUVs. Of course, we did buy quite a bit of stuff, about $300 worth, but nothing that I don't think a good sized family would uh, you know, use or buy. So what I notice is when you lay the back seat down, it does not lay flat. It is that kind of old style SUV angle. And that takes away from some of the ease of loading large objects. But you can get a 50 inch TV in the back flat. It is wide enough and long enough. And that's a good, good sort of normal thing that you could see trying to carry in a box. So that's uh, the good news. The bad news is if you're trying to use this vehicle to take two people to the airport, you're likely going to have to put some of the luggage, uh, especially if they use the bigger roll roller boards or the bigger rolling hard case suitcases, you're probably going to have to utilize part of the back seat 
and the rear cargo area. But all in all, this vehicle is really meant for in town. So let's cover some of the luxury features so that you know what you get for $50,000. All right, so what luxury features does this vehicle have uh, that, that really make $50,000 worth it? Well, Range Rovers, and especially the Range Rover Sport, to me was one of the most comfortable vehicles I had driven in the SUV segment. When it comes to the CUV segment, does the Evoque stand up? I think from a comfort perspective, this vehicle is pretty comfortable. What I noticed though, is that the seats are a lot narrower because of this narrower format of the vehicle, and they're not as well cushioned as the Range Rover Sport. So it does not give me the perspective of being the most comfortable CUV I've, I've ridden in, but it's definitely comfortable. I think it has more comfort than say, the X3 because BMW seats to me personally are a little flat. Uh, I also think that it is probably on par with the GLK, although I, I do like the bolstering that is built in standard to this uh, Range Rover Evoque. Now, the Evoque also you know, has the same uh, navigation and entertainment system that you'll find in the Range Rover Sport and in the Jaguar line. So if you're used to an XJ or an XF, you will notice that this is very much the same system and it has all of that capability. So you've got your navigation, it's touch screen, you have cameras. So if I stop, pull over here on this no outlet and I say, okay, let me see the cameras, it does have and I, you can't really see this, but it has left side, back, right side, front right corner, and front left corner. That's excellent, especially from an off-road perspective, but that's excellent for the urban environment, which is where most of the Evokes are gonna find themselves, is in an urban environment, uh, basically conquering the urban jungle. So it's kind of neat. You've got uh, the ability to uh, do a proximity view, and that's for your right side and your front right and front left. Uh, you can also do special views, which is kind of cool. So uh, you have some side camera views right on the side. So what's kind of interesting is I can see the road close sign there and I can see that fence post over there. So it really is what they call a junction view. And that's very British of them. So that's something you won't find in like the Mercedes. It does not have this camera set up. But you've got some other pretty cool features like the heated seats. They aren't air conditioned at this price point or in this uh, vehicle line, so you don't have that. But if I turn the car off, A, it's a twist dial. You'll also notice that I didn't put it in park. It does that automatically for you if you turn the car off and you, you're just sitting there. And that's nice because it doesn't yell at you, it doesn't ding, it just it puts it in park and applies the parking brake all for you as a safety feature. Whereas the Dodge, uh, well I should say the Ram 1500 that we tested that had the twist dial, it yells at you, then uh, tells you that it's doing the automatic park, and then makes you turn the key on and off to get the key out of the ignition because it didn't have the push button start like this one does in the intelligent key. So those are things that you're gonna wanna just note that there's some real thought process that goes into the design and usability of the user interfaces in these vehicles. So if I start the car back up, it doesn't yell at me, it just tells me that uh, you know it's ready to go. It does have, however, dual climate control, dual front heated seats, and it has all of this lovely brushed stainless trim, which is quite nice, and uh, there is a drawback though it dents and uh, the press cars get beaten up a little bit. And so we do have a couple of nicks on the side here from passengers, probably uh, them putting their uh, things in or people putting in uh, different items in the front seat like laptop bags and stuff like that. So some interesting features though. Okay, so what about the things that the vehicle doesn't have from a feature perspective? Well, it doesn't have blind spot monitoring and you don't have adaptive cruise control, both of the things that we had on the GLK Mercedes. So that's a little interesting because of the price points. They're really not that far apart. But, you know, all in all, I say this is more of an off-road vehicle. So 
that's maybe not a completely fair comparison. You do, however, have automatic headlights and automatic windshield wipers with this vehicle. You do also have a Meridian sound system, which is uh, quite nice if you consider uh, that it really does have a good sound and you have complete control of the subwoofer, which means that you can turn just the low end bass up with the subwoofer while leaving your bass settings alone. Whereas in a lot of uh, cars, you have to jack with the bass settings to get that kind of uh, hip hop sound that a lot of us uh, are fond of. I, I like just about every kind of music. So I, uh, I can see where uh, having a little bit of thump in your trunk is not bad. Now, some other things I'd like to point out about this vehicle is all the wheel controls. You do have a color display in the middle. Like right now, the radio is on, but it's just turned down, and I can tell on the FM what it's playing, and the same is true with the satellite radio. There uh, is a trip computer in this that I actually really like. It is an auto trip computer, and it has trip A and B. The auto trip is excellent, especially if you are trying to uh, see how far you're going in, an, in each trip that you're driving, if, if you like to know how far something is. That auto trip can stay on all the time, and you use the left turn signal to scroll through it, and it has average speed, average fuel, and your instant fuel for the trip. So uh, distance to empty and everything, all for that trip, and it resets for every trip that you do. And then, of course, you've got your trip A and B that are calculating all the time. Some other things I think are interesting is this big panoramic roof that you've probably noticed. Now, notice it does not open. It is just a big piece of glass, kind of like the Mitsubishi uh, Outlander Sport that we, uh, that we tested. Big piece of glass, it gives you a lot of light, a lot of view, great for the Rocky Mountain region because there's so much good country to look at. And if you want to close it, it is a power full sunshade and it comes all the way forward. And that's a it takes a while too, as you can see, but it has to go from just about the back of the headrests of the rear seats all the way forward here to just in front of the driver. So that's, you know, pretty impressive that they were able to get that much glass in. It's a nice, smooth looking and well refined design, and it's nice. It works well and it lets a lot of light in. And I really like that. The only thing better would be to have a tilt and slide feature, kind of like the uh, new Audi All Road. I really like that because it opens and it's got a lot of light and glass that it lets in. All in all, what you need to know about this Range Rover is that it is well put together. It has good performance. And sure, you know, your gas mileage is going to be in the teens, and we won't lie. You know, you're going to, well, let's. Uh, check our average on this trip just driving around to give you the video we're seeing about an average of 15.5 miles per gallon just driving around to tell you about this vehicle that's kind of what you're going to expect on the uh, the average here with the Range Rover Evoque but I'm fond of saying you don't buy luxury cars for fuel economy unless you're buying a hybrid like the Lexus hybrids we've looked at so if that's what you're looking for you might check out our Lexus uh, RX 450H video, but this is really an off-road capable, good looking, can go to the theater, can go to a nice dinner, can go to business appointments, and still really tackle the off-road and the inclement weather that you get in different parts of the country, like here in the Rocky Mountain regions. So that's the real video, the real review on the 2013 Range Rover Evoque. This is a pretty cool vehicle. It's got a unique look, and I really like this gloss white. Not every vehicle looks good in white, but this vehicle gives you a real high-end appearance, kind of like high-end white furniture, but it's a lot easier to keep clean. It's got great interior quality and finish, and even on the outside, the fit and finish is great. It is a fun vehicle, and it has some drawbacks and also some positives that I've talked about, but I didn't talk about the really cool LED headlights that give it an aggressive personality, and they just look neat when you pull up. And that's what this Evoque is mostly about. If you had to wrap it up in a few sentences, it's unique drive-up appeal. And when you are seeing getting out of this vehicle, people really take notice. It has 240 horsepower. It's direct injected turbocharged four cylinder. It won't get great gas mileage. 
right around that 15 miles per gallon mark is what we've been seeing in town but it can go almost anywhere off-road with the permanent all-wheel drive and the Range Rover train system that you'd be familiar with as a Range Rover fan. It is just a neat vehicle and it has cool features like the power automatic lift gate in the back that you can open from the key or the button or from inside. Wish you could close it from the key, but maybe they'll change that later. All in all, it is a neat vehicle. And for Real Auto Reports, I'm Jonathan McGrew here at Real Auto Ranch. We'll see you down the road.